Welcome, 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 everybody to the Kona Shane Veterinary Podcast. I am your host, Dr. Andy Rourke. Guys, I am here with my good, dear, awesome friend, the one and only Tasha McNerney, aka the original anesthesia nerd. Uh, she is a VTS in anesthesia. She is a fantastic lecturer. She is hilarious. She is one of my favorite people to talk to. And uh, her last, uh, her last episode with me when she was on the podcast. We talked about analgesia for uh, blocked cats, and it was very popular because it was very good. Guys, this is an equally good one. Dentistry pain control when cost is a challenge. That's right. Uh, we're not just, uh, we're, money is a real thing, and pet owners struggle with it. And also, pain is a real thing, and pets getting dental procedures struggle with it. Let's talk about cost effective management for that 11 year old Yorkie uh, who's got trench mouth and whose owner has a fixed income. Guys, this is a great episode. I hope you'll get a ton out of it. Let's get into it. This is your show. We're glad you're here. We want to help you in your veterinary career. Welcome to the Cone of Shame with Dr. Andy Rourke. Welcome to the podcast, Tasha McNerney. Thanks for being back no with me. No problem. Thanks for having me. I love talking about anesthesia oh, stuff. You, I, you are so amazing. Uh, you and I have been friends a long time. Mm -hmm. um, how good of friends are we? The last text message you sent, do you remember it? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you, I have to said, share this with the world. This is amazing. <laughs> I was just minding my business and I got a text from you that said, if you call this phone number, they will play Hall & Oates music. And, and I did. And it's real. There's a, it's, it's, real. A, it's a real phone number that you yeah. just call. It's and, a uh, call & Oates. So you can call in and hear whatever song you want from Hall & Oates. Call & Oates. Yeah, yeah, for those of you at home who are just like, I, have to, I don't believe this is true. It's a seven one nine two six six two eight three seven. That's seven one nine twenty six oats. And if you call that phone number, they'll be playing all in oats. Mm -hmm. That's that's the type of communications I get from you, uh, and that's why we're such good friends. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the other reason we're such good friends is because you're brilliant, and because you are a VTS in anesthesia. And because you were super down to earth, real world, uh, you have uh, worked in private practice uh, your, almost your whole career. You did some lab animal stuff for a little while, but um, for the most yeah. part, you have been a, uh, a private practice uh, teacher and technician. And so you know how it really is. So anyway, I have a case that I would like your very specific set of skills on, if you don't mind. I can do it. Let's go. You just yeah they can't they can't see you nodding your head <laughs> on the podcast. I was trying to think <laughs> okay. of like a, a fun like a Liam Neeson take in joke to put in there, but I really couldn't come up with anything. That, um, that's what I was going on. I know. You are so... I was like, oh, what? And I was trying to think about take in I'm three, embarrassed. which actually my husband and I were surprised that they made a take in three. Like, how many times can you get taken before you know you're going to be took? I, I don't. Just yeah, seeing, and I oh, love at some point you're just like, but I feel like he really should have been more prepared for this. Well, I agree. I, you know, one of my favorite pieces of business management advice is, you know, if there's something that you're surprised by again and again, at some point you're not surprised by it. It's your business model, and I would say that to <laughs> Liam Neeson. Uh, you need to take care of this and stop asking surprised when people take your children. Yeah. All right, <laughs> let's 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 do this medical thing. I have got a 11-year-old uh, female spade Yorkshire Terrier named Tinkerbell. Uh, she is very loved by her uh, by her elderly uh, owner. And she's, you can imagine her, she is your older Yorkie. She's just, she, you look at her, look at her in your mind's eye. She's trembling and she has trench mouth. She has a nasty, funky mouth that cannot be ignored. Mom loves her to pieces and has really been afraid of anesthesia for a long time, which is why we're kind of in a hole here as far as her dental health and things like that. Mom is also on a fixed income. And so she has, uh, you know, she has limited resources to spend here. So I have a significant dental uh, procedure in front of me. And I want to make sure that Tinkerbell is, um, is comfortable. Uh, pain management is gonna be really important for me. And I'm working under financial constraints. And so let me put it to you like that and say, Tasha McNerney, how do you treat this? 
Yeah, I yeah, this is a good one because I feel like this happens all the time in private practice. Um, in fact, it happens at university level too in their dentistry departments. It happens all over because people are scared of anesthesia, and I totally get it. Um, if you were, I mean, I knock on wood have only had a couple anesthetic experiences in my life, but I have to tell you, even though I know so much about anesthesia, I'm very comfortable with it. Um, it's scary, right? So right. I think, oh, that, yeah, We're doing it. I get it. Yeah. For this patient in particular, we have to look at if our finances are really limited, how, and we know we're about to do multiple extractions, how can we provide the best experience mm -hmm. for this patient and make sure analgesia is taken care of um, without breaking the bank? And there's some ways that we can do that, certainly. Uh, I think one of the first things is, is you have to look at kind of what's in your anesthesia or your analgesia spice rack at your clinic. So right. if you have options, that's going to be a little bit easier. Certainly, we can say, yeah, Ta I, Tasha McNerney, as an anesthesia nerd, I love fentanyl and I love methadone. Those are really great analgesic opioids that I can choose for my patients. But if I'm looking at it purely from a cost perspective, then I have to maybe look at, oh, could I potentially utilize something like hydromorphone instead for this patient? That's going to be a little more cost effective of all my pure mu opioids. And yeah, hydromorphone would be a really good uh, opioid for this patient. Now, let's say in clinic you don't have access to any pure mu opioids. Um, either your clinic doesn't utilize them uh, or buprenorphine is maybe the strongest opioid you have. Well, that's fine too. If buprenorphine mm -hmm. is the strongest opioid you have on your shelf, then let's use that, okay? But from a yes. cost perspective, yes, I would maybe not utilize the methadone in this patient because I know uh, mills, dollar per mill, it's going to be more expensive than something like hydro. So let's just say I'm utilizing right. hydro for this patient. And now I don't want to sure. just give a, a, you know, a huge whopping dose of hydro to this patient. Um, I don't know what other comorbidities it has, but if it's an 11-year-old Yorkie that has a really, really diseased mouth, we know that it probably has some degree of infection going on, inflammation going on. Let's just hope that it doesn't have any cardiac issues going on. Now, maybe we have an echo in the previous past, but because we are financially limited, probably we don't. If you have the ability to, okay. and if the dog is amenable to it, I would suggest that your staff at least get a pre-op ECG and blood pressure on this patient. Any of those things that you can get beforehand are going to make it a lot easier for you intraoperatively in how to manage that case. So if you notice that this patient's normal resting heart rate is 162, or if you notice that it's 82, that's going to kind of guide where you're going to go with your drug selection, your inhalant, maybe your blood pressure support, et cetera. Also, if you note any mm -hmm. murmurs or anything like that. Again, all of these things are just really nice to know before we start layering in a bunch of drugs. If it is a right. smaller Yorkie, 11 years old, <laughs> I feel like I say this a lot. I love dexmedetomidine, but this is probably not the dog that I would go dexmedetomidine with, only because, you know, I hate to be a breedist, but if it potentially has any cardiac or mitral valve disease underlying that we don't know about because we haven't followed it uh, or got an echo, I don't want to make things worse with dexmedetonine. So this is probably not a dog I'm going to hit with dexmedetonine, which from a cost perspective, right. that's okay because dexmedetonine, again, one of our more expensive, you know, dollar per mil drugs. So I'm probably right. going to go with something a little bit more cost effective, maybe a, a small dose of midazolam for this patient, followed by my right. induction agent. Now, we have a couple of choices for induction agent. You can have um, alfaxalone. I know a lot of clinics are utilizing alfaxalone. Or you can utilize propofol, which a lot of clinics are using propofol. Both really great drugs and both have um, a pretty nice safety profile when utilized correctly in the correct dose mix per mil. However, you know, there were some studies, there were some claims that alfaxalone is going to be better as far as apnea or hypotension. But what we found is that there really isn't that much of a difference between alfaxalone and propofol when it comes to overall hypertension if you're using it within the dose range. So again, because of a cost per mil for this patient in particular, I'm trying to be cognizant of cost, I would probably choose the propofol and be as slow with my dose, gotcha. right? Just get them induced and then get them on inhalant. Now, this patient in particular, we know has a trench mouth and is going to be a lot of extractions. Mm -hmm. This is where... 
your local blocks, right? So bupivacaine, lidocaine, things that are very cost effective, this is where your analgesia heavy lifting is going to be done with the local blocks. So instead of putting this okay. patient on maybe an expensive fentanyl CRI or something like that, you can do local blocks or four point local blocks in the mouth, and that's going to cover everything. So if you had to do even full mouth extractions on this patient, if you're doing your um, both of the mandibular and maxillary maxillary blocks that you should be doing on these patients. And let's say your practice doesn't even have bupivacaine, you only have lidocaine. Great. Utilize your lidocaine. That's going to give you a couple hours of pain free. It's going to, it, you're then going to be able to keep your inhalant turned down. And when you can keep your inhalant down and your oxygen down, that's going to be co cost effective for you as a clinic. <laughs> so anytime we don't have to have cranking high levels of oxygen, high level of inhalant, that's going to be better overall, not only for our patient, but for our finances. And then intraoperatively, if you feel like this patient still needs a little bit of bump of something, and this patient is not a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy cat, we know it's a little yorky. This is mm -hmm. where a low dose ketamine CRI can be really nice for MAC reduction, again, to keep your inhalant low. Ketamine is very, very cost effective. So a little bit of ketamine can go a very long way. So you can put your ketamine into uh, either into a bag and run it on a pump or into a syringe and run it on a syringe pump. But you can do a low dose ketamine CRI to reduce your inhalant, increase your analgesia. So those two things together, local blocks, low dose ketamine CRI, very, very cheap, but very, very effective when it comes to analgesia and reducing the amount of inhalant. And then as the patient's waking gotcha. up, you know, then it's kind of dealer's choice how they do under anesthesia, whether or not, and what their blood work shows, whether or not the clinician wants to add in a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory. Okay. I like it. Hey, everybody. I just want to jump in real quick with a couple of updates. This week over on the Uncharted Veterinary Podcast, which is the other podcast I do with the one and only Stephanie Goss. I'm not on that episode. Stephanie Goss is talking about information security. Are you storing data in your practice like you're supposed to? Guys, this is not an area where you want to get burned. If you are not up to date or you're kind of feeling like, ooh, I should probably listen to that. <laughs> Head over to the Uncharted Veterinary Podcast and check it out uncharted workshops coming at you guys on may the 21st which is just a couple of days after this episode comes out at 2 p.m eastern 11 a.m pacific stephanie goss she is teaching our workshop retain your team speak the languages of appreciation in your workplace guys you're trying to get your team motivated you're trying to keep morale up you're trying to keep uh, people engaged you want your team to stick around to enjoy the work that they're doing and to feel like they matter to you and to the patients guys are you talking about appreciation in your workplace? Are you doing it effectively? If not, jump in. This is uh, this is a little bit higher level. We had a, an entry level appreciation workshop. This is a bit more down into the nitty gritty. Um, I, I think I think people are gonna get a lot out of it. It is $99 to the public. It is free to our Uncharted members. I'll put a link down in the show notes below. On June the 8th, my friend Bill Schroeder, a veterinary marketing specialist, CEO of InTouch Veterinary Marketing, uh, he is going to be doing his lectures. It's not a lecture, it's a workshop called Creating Content That Clients Crave. This is all about you spending your time smartly to make resources that educate clients, that answer questions, that protect your reputation, that do all of the things that you wish you had content for, but you just don't have all the time in the world to make. Most of us are spending too much time doing things like posting stupid social media stuff. Guys, it's time to get a strategy. It's time to get smart about how we communicate digitally. Bill Schroeder is the guy to do that. It is $99 to the public. It is free for Uncharted members. Guys, both of those things are coming up. I'm going to put links to both of them in the show notes. Let's get back into this episode. Give me, um, give me any pearls you have, any words of advice on the ketamine CRI. I know there's a lot of people out there who, uh, who kind of draw back a little bit from CRIs. I think it's still one of those things. Uh, it's become a, a lot more common, but I still think a lot of practices are just intimidated. When when you say CRI, I think a lot of a lot of technicians, a lot of doctors, kind of go, mm, oh, I don't yeah, know, it's kind of scary. I get it. <laughs> uh, make 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 it seem less scary to me. Yeah. Oh sure. So I think when most of us 
when we think of CRI, as we think back to when we were in vet school or tech school and we were at, you know, universities and we were seeing these animals that are on what we call like the tree of life, where they're on multiple CRIs because yep. they're, they're, you know, their state is so critical that they have to be on fentanyl and lidocaine and dobutamine yeah. and norepi and something else and plasma. So we're not talking about that. We're just talking about adding in a little bit of extra pain control to make the procedure go smoother overall. And the only reason I'm talking specifically about ketamine in this one is because if we look at overall uh, cost effectiveness, now I could say that lid a lidocaine CRI would also be a very cost effective. But for this patient in particular, I think a ketamine CRI is a nice adjunct analgesia wise. Cost per mil, very, very effective. And it doesn't require that you have to have a syringe pump. So most of the time they're also thinking, oh, well, I don't have a syringe pump. I only have my regular Baxter pump. I can't run something as fancy as a constant rate infusion, but you can add a small amount of ketamine to a 250 or a 500 ml bag of saline and figure out the math. Uh, I know the math is intimidating, but don't mm -hmm. worry. There's lots of CRI calculators online that can help you with this. Um, the International Veterinary Academy of Pain Management or IVAPM.org, if you go to their website or even the um, website on your phone, they have CRI calculators where you just punch in the patient's current weight and what dose you want the CRI to be run at, and they'll give you the mils or volume per hour that you should put into your Baxter pump. So don't feel like you have to have a syringe pump in order to make this work. You don't. You can just have, as long as you have some ketamine, a bag of saline, and a Baxter pump, we can run this into our patient. And we're just talking a low-dose ketamine. So low-dose ketamine is also different because I know sometimes people kind of like Ugh, cringe a little bit with just the thought of ketamine, right? Because we have these mm -hmm. ideas of 10 years ago when we were using much higher doses of ketamine. And we know that higher doses of ketamine and higher doses really of anything are going to cause higher incidences of side effects. But in ketamine in particular, ketamine, once you get into the higher dosing range, it goes from analgesic to anesthetic. And it has more of these central effects that we see. And I think that people were, and rightly so, I think a cat on a really high dose of ketamine can be kind of scary thing to watch. And they usually don't have the best recovery. That's where that ketamine crazies kind of um, saying came from was really high mm -hmm. dose ketamine. When I'm talking high dose, I'm talking about like 15 to 20 mg per kick. So like these big doses of ketamine, which we don't tend to use anymore. And when we're talking about analgesic doses of ketamine, we're talking about like one mg per kick, two mg per kick maybe. So smaller, mm -hmm. smaller doses. We're not seeing the same type of side effects we used to in the past. All right. If I have doctors or technicians that want to brush up on their dental blocks, do you have a resources you would point people to They say, this is a good review of your blocks? Yes. So for dental blocks in particular, I am a book reader. So if you like to read books, and actually, if you're interested in local blocks in general, there's a really good textbook of regional anesthesia in the small animal patient. And I believe it is by Campoy and Reed, uh, Campoy out of Cornell. And I'm pretty sure that I got my copy on Amazon, but it goes through every single local block that you could think of from epidurals to ring blocks. You know, if you had to, you know, take a toe off of a patient to sacred coccygeal blocks, if you had to do a tail amputation to all of the dental blocks. And there's a bunch of different dental blocks that we can utilize. And I think there's also a really cool thing about dental blocks that we also sometimes don't think about is that they don't actually only have to be for dentistry. So sometimes we will utilize a infraorbital block bilaterally if we have to go in and you know take a tumor off the nose or if we have to do a rhinoscopy mm -hmm. or something like that. So they're not just for dentistry. I always tell people that, look, again, local blocks are going to do a lot of your analgesia heavy lifting during the surgery, right? Because we could just put our patients on 5% ISO and kick back and they're not going to move. But that's not really balanced anesthesia or analgesia. We want to make sure that we don't have the patient on 5% ISO, that we have it on the low ISO, and we're doing a lot of local blocks to take care of those pain signals going to the brain. And if you can utilize a local block for every single patient, whether it be a tooth extraction or a, um, you know, a radi radius ulnar fracture that's coming in to a skin incision, right, a laceration repair. So there's a local block for everything. And if we're talking about lidocaine in particular, it's a very, very, very cheap way to provide pain management. 
Perfect. That's fantastic. I will put uh, links to the to the book and then also to the CRI calculators uh, down in the show notes. Uh, Tasha, thank you so much for being here and doing this with me. Where can people find you online? Where can they follow all the stuff that you're doing? Because you're doing a lot of things. Yeah, we are doing a lot of things. So I am most active on the Facebook group, Veterinary Anesthesia Nerds, and also on our website. So if you ever have any questions, you know, hit me up on Anesthesia Nerds or send us an email through the website. Also, the Veterinary Anesthesia Nerds are kind of like going on tour uh, together. All three of us administrators are, I know, um, we are going to all be present at the Fetch conference that's happening in Charlotte, North Carolina. And then we're also going to be present at the one that's going to be in San Diego this year. So kind of East Coast, Very West Coast nice. opportunities to do some stuff and talk about how we can elevate the standard of care for anesthesia patients. Veterinary anesthesia nerds coast to coast is yeah. what I'm hearing. <laughs> so good. Awesome. Well, guys, thanks. Uh, thanks so much for being here. Tasha, thanks so much for being here. I uh, always appreciate your time. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. And that's our episode. Guys, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you got a ton out of it. Um, if you did, please feel free to leave us an honest review wherever you get your podcast. It really makes a difference to me. Um, it's how people find us. It's, it's the nicest thing that you can do, and it only takes a moment. Gang, that's all I got. Take care of yourselves. Be well. I'll talk to you soon. Bye.